I'm Murray Barber, and I'm very pleased to share with you this morning. What a gift that we can look to God's Word for encouragement and guidance as we live and serve together. When my nearly 101-year-old and nearly blind mother died last month, I got an email from a cousin. He wrote, Your mom's likely wondering what all the fuss is about. Sights return, and there's so much to see. You'll recall Terry Smith's wonderful messages a few weeks ago with a theme from the Hebrew language, Habar, meaning crossing over, about Israel crossing over the Jordan River into the land of promise, into Canaan. Terry didn't know that my mom had crossed over Jordan just the day before. I think that's God's smile. I received notes and cards, online messages and phone calls as friends offered their words of sympathy and comfort. And as we gathered as a family to say goodbye, we said as folk do, we should get together more often and not just on these sad occasions. But they were there for us. It's what families do. It's what churches do. It's what Kingsway does, as we have known so many losses and good, said so many goodbyes to dear ones in these last few months. Christians bear each other's burdens. So this morning I want to talk with you about community. And my text is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 9 to 17. We'll read them in just a moment. We affirm in our KBC vision statement that we want to be growing in community and engaging like Jesus in our world. In our mission statement, we embrace fellowship, saying we want to invite people into authentic relationships, responding to each other's needs so that life and faith thrive. Now here's our text, and I want to show you my text as well as read it this morning. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now here are some initial observations from the text. We see what Jesus has been doing, teaching about God's kingdom, as always, and setting people free from all that ailed them. So wonderful. And then after a night's prayer of the, of the many disciples and followers, Jesus chose 12 to be his apostles. Three things then from these verses. Disciples were chosen to be with Jesus. That's true spirituality. 
and then two, they would be with each other. That follows, and that's authentic community. They would be sent next out into a new vocation, into mission for God, and that is a compelling destiny. This morning I want us to think for a few moments what it means that we are called to be together, just as we have been called to be with Jesus, and then to share that in loving, caring engagement in our world. I wonder what it was like to be there that day, listening on the shore, watching the miracles of healing and deliverance, and then later to be called to be in the company of Jesus and often in the same boat with him, together with other disciples. But indeed, Jesus is present with us too today in our personal lives and in his majesty's good ship, Kingsway Baptist Church. Some of us are worshiping in Kingsway's beautiful building this morning. And as in any boat, you are seated in the nave. Before you is the pulpit, as there is a pulpit at the front of any boat. This metaphor from those first days when Jesus taught in and from a boat about his way, his truth, his life. And so we have spirituality, community, and destiny, but I want to focus this morning on the theme of community. My text is four letters. It's the word with. For there's a withness in the gospel. We're not alone. We're a band of sisters and brothers journeying on together. If I was to entitle the message, it would be bound together in the bundle of life. This wonderful phrase is from the Old Testament when a beautiful woman named Abigail met King David on a road trip one day. Her husband was a cruel, abusive man who got his comeuppance and early judgment. Later, she became David's wife. But the phrase is in something she said when she first met David. It was a prophetic word, both of encouragement for David, but also of warning to his enemies. She said to David, someone has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but your life shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he will fling out as from the pocket of a sling. Whether in plighting our troth, that is making covenant vow in marriage, or in being in the same family, or in an office with other people, or a sports team, or being members, adherents, and friends together in a local church, we are bound together in life, held in the hollow and safety of our Savior's hand. We may sometimes feel alone, be alone, but we are bound to each other and to our God. Many are glad to be alone with Jesus, as we must be, all of us at times. But in another sense, it's not just Jesus and me. Some would prefer to have a personal and private spirituality. Churches and church problems and church people bother them. Who needs that? But, writes St. John, and I paraphrase a bit, don't tell me you love God if you can't stand your brother or your sister. So there's witness with Jesus and with each other. The New Testament word church is from the Greek word ecclesia. It means to assemble. It's an invitation to be together. Jesus says, I will build my church. And to do that, he brings people together. And I think, too, of the last chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, where the book is full of great theology. It's difficult and intricate in parts. And, and full of inspiring doxologies. But it ends with all these names of mere and humble people who somehow were dear to Paul because he, he had served with them in various times and in various circumstances, sometimes in very harrowing circumstances. They had served Jesus. They had served Paul. 
they had served each other together. Paul writes also in Galatians chapter 6, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. It's strange that, for we have been taught that joy comes in putting Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. But that's not biblical. We are to love God first and others as we love ourselves. And we do that first. If we have no up-to-date life and love in God, we have little to share with others. And so we need to pray, as Amy Grant has found, Lord, lead me today to someone I need and to someone who needs me. I think there's something powerful and true in that thinking. It's the same kind of wisdom as when we travel on an airplane and for some reason oxygen is needed and a mask drops down in front of us and we have to put on our own mask first before we help our child or anyone else. When we take care for ourselves spiritually and then others too in the body, together we'll be more fit and fitted to help others, pre-Christians who as yet do not know Christ. As an introvert, I, I'm drained by people, I admit it. Extroverts, I, I'm told, are enriched by relationships and gatherings. But as an introvert, I'm not lonely when I'm alone. But to think even in my last year at seminary that I would serve the Lord by being a pastor, I thought I'd be a missionary, a journalist in some remote place of the world. So shy, too shy. But to have a people job, to be an upfront preacher, I did not welcome that idea. But God called me through a series of dreams in one week of my final year. And I found myself not protesting because you can't talk back to God so much in a dream. I could actually see myself doing it, and it was okay. And after a week of such dreams, I, I awakened one morning to say to Jane, I think I'm supposed to be a pastor. Well, everyone knows that, said Jane. But I didn't, I replied, till now. Be careful what you tell God you'll never do. God changes us in and through community. He changes us when we're near to him for sure, but also when we live, walk, and serve alongside each other in our faith community. Spiritually speaking, we're all diamonds in the rough. We're saints in name only as yet, gradually growing to be mature in Christ. And Christian community is key, for it can make us smoother, brighter, more brilliant for Christ. Do you know the skill or hobby of lapidary, where there's a little machine and a tumbler device that smooths and polishes rocks and minerals into round, bright gemstones? So it is, too, that the rough edges of our stony hearts and lives are made smooth, shiny, and beautiful in community. And some of that tumbling and polishing has to do with conflict in the community. The Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy began his novel Anna Karenina with these words. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. The church, too, is a family. And some are mostly happy through the years, while others are unhappy. But few families and few churches escape times of ailment, disappointment, division, and loss. Every church has sicknesses unique to itself. And just like today in most churches, the disciples were sometimes fighting, perhaps often fighting, disagreeing, competing among themselves, both for attention and self-promotion, and because they just didn't get it till they did. We must face the struggles, conflicts, trials, sickness together. We want to learn rather than leave, because such times and such difficulties can be rich, growing times in our life. If we prayerfully allow God to heal and change us, He will, and He will help and heal others too. 
God would like to change us all a little more. Okay, <laughs> a lot more. In the direction of love, joy, patience, long-suffering, endurance, peacefulness. So we pray and lean in on the oars. Paul reminds us of what Christ's love looks like in 1 Corinthians 13 and what our loving can grow to be. He writes, with Philip's paraphrase, love doesn't keep records of wrong. It's slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. It's not anxiously trying to impress anyone. It's not touchy. It doesn't gloat over evil or the badness of others. It's glad when truth prevails. There's no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of hope. Again, this fruit of the Spirit does not grow overnight, as in the same way nature fruit takes time to mature and ripen. There are always hurting folk around us, hurting people in the church as well as in the community. Everyone hurts, and community can help. The song Everyone Hurts was written by the U.S. rock band R.E.M., made famous by the Corps, the Irish group. And it reminds us that there are hurting people everywhere around us. We may be quiet ourselves, even, when, even stoical, when we are hurting about our own situation. Maybe we tell Jesus, maybe not even. Sure, some overshare, but perhaps we don't share enough, and nobody knows of our need, and we are not healed when we might be. By Jesus, and through the smile, the hand, the presence, the prayer of another. I remember gratefully how Paul and Pat Gregory drove me to hospital appointments many times. Back in the mid-1990s, the last millennium. <laughs> after I suffered a DVT in my right leg and, and clotted lungs. That took me out of ministry here at KBC for nearly two years. There are people in the same boat all around us, dear ones. Dear ones who need our presence and our care. They need a note or a card, an email, a visit, the sharing of our life, our vocation, maybe even a vacation. Such sharing would astound them and glorify Jesus and bless us. Some people we know are just really lonely. Ah, look at all the lonely people scolded the Beatles in the song Eleanor Rigby. There are people living alone, widows, widowers, seniors, others whose only people contact is the checkout person at Bob Laws or Metro, and that's closed. Do you use the checkout machines? I mean, the personal ones in, in some retail stores. Some stores have taken them out, you know, the, like, Wal, like Walmart. It may be about thefts when some aren't honest about how much they're checking out or what they're checking out. But also because some research has shown that lots of folk would rather stand in line, even a long line, to be served by a real person. Some stores have even created an area where people can sit and have a coffee or tea and chat together. But having said that, there's also a shout out to be made for today's communication technology that can also help build community. There's the internet to augment phone calls and emails and Zoom interactions. We've always thought that this is not real community. And in one sense, actually being together is still vitally important if we can. But sometimes it's not possible. I'm immunity compromised and I can't be in a large crowd for very long, if ever, in some cases. And I'm struck by the number of people who've told me that they've experienced great blessing through our services and ministries online at Kingsway. Some have said that the interactions in online small groups during COVID and some that continue have been very, very helpful for them and have given them a sense of belonging that they hadn't experienced before. There's been rich learning and deep caring and deep sharing in their group. So there's that. They'll know we're Christians by our love. 
Yes, perhaps if they come and watch us loving on each other as we gather, as we worship, as we fellowship, as we eat together. But especially will this be so when that love is directed to them, where they are and in their particular need. As with this story in Mark's Gospel, some will press in for Jesus' help through us, perhaps today, others we need to go to as sent ones in mission. And that's why each of us and all of us sometimes together as a church must have Holy Spirited nudges about who and what and when and how. And as we pray for those, I believe God will speak and show us about how we can respond and to whom this day. We know that there are many ways to help. We're aware of food insecurity as people are physically hungry. They're spiritually hungry too, many. Starved for friendship and for a listening ear and for food on the table. I was challenged by an out-of-town friend this week, well, a week or so ago, who, who asked me what Kingsway was doing about homeless refugees sleeping on Peter Street downtown. I scrambled. I, I mentioned our sharing in and through our CBM Summer Mission Project, and I hope all of us are involved with that and sharing to reach the $2,000 goal that we have set for our own church. And I shared about our work with Matthew House over the years and Stonegate. But I still wondered if we, if I couldn't do more. Friends, here are just a few takeaway reminders from our text to this morning. First, the precious reality that Jesus is in our boat and all that that involves. He shares life with us in times of calm and also when the sea billows roll. And then what follows from that is that we are called not only to him, we're called to be in the same boat with each other. And we do well when we help each other and care for each other. People neared around us, hurting, lonely, and we have so much to share. Our neighbor has obvious need. Will we respond and do something beautiful for God? And finally, God has called us into mission. We may, be, we may not be the original 12, but each of us is an, is an apostle from the Greek word apostoles, literally meaning sent ones. We, too, are sent ones, disciples and apostles of Jesus. This morning, as we come to the table of our Lord, we will remember our Lord's death, the suffering for us to take away our sins. We will also remember in the sense that the body, though diverse and at church and even at home this morning, will come together. The members will join together as one body in love of Jesus and in the fellowship of each other. I'm reminded of an old hymn written by John Fawcett that's still relevant. And <laughs> perhaps I could just add the hymn and that would be all that was necessary this morning. But here it is. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. When we are called to part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. This glorious hope revives our courage by the way, while each in expectation lives and waits to see the day. From sorrow, toil and pain and sin, we shall be free and perfect love and friendship reign.
through all eternity. Thanks be to God. <laughs>